Uh, I want to welcome everyone. I'm Joanne Gear. I'm Executive Director for the Westchester Biotech Project. And welcome today to today's roundtable uh, on establishing your first lab. Uh, I want to, uh, we're going to welcome in a moment Dr. Weedman from Seton Hall and Dr. Bodega from Rutgers. Oops. I'm going to. Oh, no, 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 there's no surprises. Here we go. Uh, the Westchester Biotech Project started, uh, we launched in about uh, spring of 2017. And our real mission is to bring together researchers, engineers, and data scientists. Uh, because obviously that's the key collaborators to create anything new and to take anything through a regulatory process. We're based in Westchester County, New York, which is just north of New York City. And we are very happy to collaborate with anybody who wants to. Uh, we just signed an MOU for Westchester Biotech Project Europe, which is kind of great. And uh, so we have a, a really nice and growing footprint. Um, Michael, do you want to say anything now? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you're all warm wherever you are. Uh, I, I want to thank you all for participating uh, and, and obviously to Dr. Weedman and Dr. Bodeka for contributing to this conversation. Um, Joanne has a, a mantra that she lives by, which is it's very hard to become a researcher and it's even harder to stay as one. And so we, we have committed uh, as many resources and, and, and our efforts to helping support uh, scientists and researchers stay at the bench uh, from start to finish. So we're, we're excited that this is part of that effort and uh, hopefully uh, folks who are joining us will, will learn something productive and uh, help continue us along those lines. So thank you all for joining us and uh, looking forward to a great conversation. Thank you, Michael. Um, we do a lot of different programs and initiatives, and I'm not going to go into depth on these. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple of them. Uh, so this roundtable is part of our Young Investigators program, which focuses on the sort of PhD postdoc era through about age 40 and all that good stuff they don't teach you in school that you need to do when you become a PI. Um, I just mentioned the Biotech Project in Europe. and. Uh, on March 27th, we are holding our next Innovation in Research Conference, which will be at Westchester Community College. It'll go up on the website very shortly. And that's a full day with symposia and, um, and a look at, uh, there's some major growth happening in Westchester. About two weeks ago, a 99-year lease was signed for a 60-acre parcel, euphemistically, euphemistically called the North 60 which is becoming a $1.2 billion life science research park. So all the things we do are important things to be doing to you know, raise the water for everybody in the life sciences. But of course, an exciting program like that is unleashing some really great uh, resources and energy and so on. And, and we've been honored to be part of that process. Um, we will be doing a rare disease symposium again this summer. Uh, we run a an international consortium on translating uh, translational research in the microbiome and various other things. So we have a really nice mix of programs online, uh, which are just all free so far, and uh, some in-person in sessions. Uh, we do a lot of roundtables, and I'm not going to go through all of those. They're on our website. and. Everyone here is certainly invited to get involved as you wish. Uh, I will mention for this group, uh, one of the things, I know there's a lot of people who are uh, early stage uh, professors as well as being young investigators. And through our roundtable for educators and employers, we're developing the Westchester Certificate, which goes into five key areas for, of essential skills for anybody that works in the lab from a tech to a PI. So it's safety, um, uh, lab notebook practice, aseptic technique, sustainability in the lab, and understanding the drug development process. And that's in the works. And yes, you're invited to get involved with that as well, whether you're in Westchester or not. It's a, it's a really nice curriculum. And we're collaborating with about seven colleges and four or five companies. So it's a nice interactive uh, program that will be piloted beginning this spring. 
Um, today's program, I'm going to just share one more slide. So we, you know, we welcome, we really appreciate all of the organizations, the universities, the companies, the uh, suppliers, the consultants, everybody who has worked with us. Uh, you know, it's a very, you know, there's a, there's a lot of excitement out there and the more we know about each other and the more we can do together, the better it is for everyone. So we've been honored to gather a really wonderful collaborative uh, community. Uh, we'll be transitioning over uh, to uh, Dr. Reedman to, I'm sorry, to, uh, I'm going to introduce Doreen in a moment to introduce uh, Greg, uh, but I just want to tell you that um, we're going to hear from Dr. Reedman first, and then we're going to move into a roundtable format where we'll ask everybody on the call to introduce yourself and, you know, any comments on the content you've heard, any questions you'd like to get into, you can feel free to add questions to the chat box and we probably will save them all till the end. We'll let Dr. Reedman tell the story he wants to tell and then we'll have a, a further discussion. Um, Doreen, would you like to take it from here? I would love to. Thank you, Joanne. And thank you, Michael. And special thanks to Chris who has been organizing um, everything and it's the person you've been receiving emails from. Uh, I've known Joanne for a while and I really like this um, Young Investigators Initiative just because and again this is a line from right from the web page in Joanne's book is what they don't teach you in school. Um, it is very interesting how there are these um, lessons and important things you might need to know to succeed, to succeed, especially if you are uh, planning for a career as a faculty. And as there are, as faculty jobs uh, positions become more and more competitive, um, I think it is very important to know and to, to know those things. And I'm very excited that we have uh, Dr. Reedman uh, here to talk about that with us today. Uh, so we've known uh, Dr. Weedman for a while, um, and uh, he's currently the Assistant Professor of Biochemistry and Chemical Biology at Seton Hall. And prior to that, he was a postdoctoral researcher at the Public Health Research Institute here at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. We are located in Newark, and that's uh, my connection to Dr. Weedman, and uh, I know him. Um, Greg's uh, PhD research was prior to that. He was at John Hopkins University. Uh, where he worked with Dr. Rosowa and also in collaboration with Dr. Peter Searson of uh, John Hopkins and Dr. Wimley of Tulane University Medical School. Greg, um, Dr. Beatman has an interesting uh, profile where he has two patents um, based on his previous uh, work in, in under in his doctorate and postdoctoral research. Um, so he has experience with non-disclosure agreements, material transfer agreements. So anyone in the audience, if you have questions about that, uh, you can ask that uh, to Dr. Weedman now or later in emails. Um, he also received the Integrative Graduate Education and Research uh, Trainship, the IGERT Program Fellowship, and also a fellowship from the Center for Integration of uh, Research, Teaching, and Learning, also called the CERTO. And lastly, without taking much of your time, uh, Dr. Weedman's lab, his lab is called the 3B lab, and he studies cells and the cell membrane that facilitate drug delivery and, in the end, improve healthcare. And with that, uh, Dr. Weedman, the stage is all yours. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Dr. We you should have, oh. I, I sent it to you, then I took it back, but I, you should have a little pop up. Uh, I'm sending it right now to make yourself the presenter so you can show your slides. Okay. There you are. All right. So can everybody see my screen here? There you go. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you so much, Doreen, for, uh, for the uh, very kind introduction. As, as Doreen mentioned, I've uh, known her for a couple of years now, and we've worked together on uh, a lot of different projects that had to do with um, improving the uh, postdoc experience at Rutgers University and sort of thinking about transition from a postdoc to academia. And uh, I'm happy to say that this past year, I was able to make that transition. So uh, as uh, Doreen mentioned, and, and also uh, I would thank the um, organizers from the Westchester uh, Biotech Project for uh, allowing me to be here as well. So as, as uh, everyone mentioned, I am a, a, an assistant professor now at Seton Hall University. I am in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, and my position is uh, to be a professor of 
biochemistry and chemical biology. So uh, just a little background on what our lab does. So as, as Doreen mentioned, we study the cell membrane generally. That's, that's what we're interested in looking at. So we're looking at um, interesting molecules that have uh, the properties of being able to interact with the cell membrane or potentially change the composition of the cell membrane. Uh, and then also thinking about how we can uh, disrupt processes that go on uh, in cellular transport and what impact that might have on human health. So I can talk about that maybe uh, at, uh, at a later date, but today what I wanted to discuss was sort of my experience getting started uh, working in the lab and, and getting the lab up and running. So as I mentioned, I started this position uh, back in August of this year. And I'd, I'd been thinking about it for a number of years, uh, going into academia and, and trying to uh, run my own lab. And I think the thing that really hit me the most when I transitioned from being a postdoc to being a principal investigator was just the fact that now everything is on me. Uh, to get stuff done in the lab, not only to get projects done, but even to develop projects, to get them running, to get them funded, uh, to work with the school to make sure we have the resources and the facilities to get these things done. Everything is now on you to take that initiative. So what I want to do today is to try to help you uh, think about some things that might uh, might improve your ability to do that along the way, or uh, some of the different things you might want to consider when you're getting started in the lab. So I had a few topics that I wanted to discuss. First, uh, getting to know some of the people that are at your university uh, and how they can help you. Uh, the second is sort of taking a stock of your area that you have to conduct your research. Uh, the third is looking at your financials. So looking at the resources that you've been given uh, and potentially how you can utilize those. Uh, the fourth point I think uh, people are quite interested in is how to actually get students involved in lab work, so how to get them going. Uh, and then finally, um, I just wanted to talk briefly about administrative work, so some of the things that you know you don't necessarily have to deal with as a postdoc, but as a PI, they are, your again, um, your responsibilities for effectively running the lab. So I think one of the key things that helped me as I was starting uh, starting out the lab this past year, were the people at the university that helped me along. So I think I have down there in the left-hand corner uh, a piece of advice, be friendly. So I think it's really, really important to be as friendly as possible. I think the first thing that you want to do when you get on the campus, before you even start putting things in lab, buying reagents, or even finding your graduate students or uh, postdocs or other students, students that might want to work in your lab, is to go around and actually introduce yourself to people. So I wanted to talk about a few of the people who you might want to introduce yourself to first. So the very first person that I think you should talk to when you get onto campus is the secretary for your department. So the secretary of your department will be a lifesaver. Almost every single department that I've worked in, whether it's at Rutgers or when I was a graduate student at Johns Hopkins or currently in my position as an uh, assistant professor at Seton Hall, everyone always says that the department secretary is the person you need to go to to get things done. So this person will be the person who knows a lot of the information about the university that might not be readily apparent to you. Uh, so for instance, I heavily relied on our department secretary here to give me an understanding of uh, what some of the purchasing processes were. So who are the actual people that I need to talk to to submit forms to? Uh, also, what are the processes for getting myself involved in certain committees? How do you actually uh, get in touch with people? And also just even general tasks that you might not think of that, uh, that you need to get done. So things like actually finding out where your office is and getting keys to your office. Uh, and getting access, lab access to your to your lab itself, um, setting up your phone. So so I'm calling you today uh, on my phone in my office here. So I needed to uh, have somebody organize that to actually get that set up, uh, and also setting up your mailbox so that you can receive information from the rest of the university 
uh, various forms that you might need to fill out or, or things that you might need to take care of for your students. These are tasks that, you know, need to get done for you to actually function as a PI. And uh, I would say that definitely make sure that you are very friendly and introduce yourself to your department secretary because they can be the person who can really be relied on for that particular uh, type of work. Uh, the, the second person you should probably talk to is the chair of your department. So likely you've met the chair of your department. If you are a uh, PI who has been uh, accepted into an academic position, uh, you at some point met the current chair of your department in your negotiation process in your in your meeting. So the chair will know what direction the department wants to take immediately with regards to your work. So uh, again, if you're someone like me, you're hired to uh, be in a specific area in biochemistry, uh, your chair will let you know that. Your chair will say, okay, you are going to be uh, beginning uh, teaching these courses because that's you know what we hired you for, or um, you know we have uh, let, let's say you're in uh, you're in an engineering school and your school has uh, a MERSEC. They have a um, uh, materials research uh, grant that they want to get renewed. So your chair can let you know, okay, we have this renewal for some institutional grant coming up, and we need you to get started right away on you know working on these particular projects. So your chair can really help you uh, get a little bit of vision, I would say, uh, with regards to what you need to get started with uh, immediately in your lab. So uh, there are things that will drive your initial work your first couple of years uh, that you might not have been aware of uh, as you were getting started at your new position. So this is the the person, at least for the time being, that you should, should look towards to figure out uh, what direction the department wants to go in and how you fit into the uh, department plan. Uh, I would say the next person, probably after talking to the people in your department that you might want to go to, is the stockroom staff. So you're not going to be able to get much done uh, without getting resources, without getting the things uh, from your stockroom, without getting things delivered to there. So you really want to get in touch with the person that uh, staffs and runs the stock room. So one thing that they can do is they can give you an idea of what reagents they keep in stock, what's readily available. So our stock room, for instance, has a list of all of the different solvents and chemicals that they have in stock. So why is that important? Well. Uh, you want to consider the fact that now, as you're a PI, uh, you're the one responsible for making sure that the people that work in the lab, uh, again, have the resources that they need. So you want to minimize the amount of time, the amount of uh, uh, lead time between uh, them getting the work or getting the reagents that they need and actually being able to conduct their experiments. So if you know that the stock room has, let's say, ethanol uh, in stock, then you know that you can pretty readily get that and you don't have to, say, order it from an online supplier and wait two or three weeks to get it. So the stock room staff can give you an idea of um, how long it, or, or what is readily available. They can also give you an idea of how long the lead times are generally for getting things that they might not have. Uh, so, for instance, they might have some experience ordering toxic reagents or ordering cell lines that uh, can be complicated or, or difficult to order. They can let you know what are some of the uh, restrictions in getting these things, if you have to fill out certain forms, if you have to uh, get certain licenses to get these products. Uh, they, can tend to, they, they can help you out with that because likely they've helped out another PI in the past with that. So the stockroom staff can, can really help you with your ordering. So I would suggest definitely uh, making yourself known to the stockroom staff. Uh, in addition to that, I would say definitely get to know uh, your facilities people. Because if you have a problem in the lab, if you know a sink's not working when you move in, uh, if the ventilation is broken, if you know somebody throws a rock through a window or something like that, you're going to need to involve the facilities department. The university or the uh, institution that you work at likely isn't going to want you to fix those things on your own. Uh, so they'll help you, uh, especially 
in, some, in the later section that I was going to mention, taking stock of your lab and figuring out what you need to get done. So I'd say the people in particular that you want to talk to at facilities is to figure out who is your building manager? Who is the manager of the building that your lab is actually in? And also see if you can figure out uh, if you can get in touch with one of the facility's engineers. So they're the people that might be able to uh, coordinate some of the work that is outside the capabilities of your building manager. You'll also want to talk to your environmental health and safety person or your just general lab safety person. So they're the contact point for you when things go wrong in the lab. So uh, you want to get to know your EHS officer to ensure that you're compliant in all of the work that you're doing, to make sure that your students are working in safe conditions, that any kind of <clears throat> contact with hazardous or toxic or uh, dangerous materials is minimized, uh, and they can help you set, set up the protocols for that. Another good thing about knowing your EHS officer is it'll lead to less surprises for you later. And what I mean by that is consider the situation where there is, say, um, a review of your department by an external agency. Your EHS person, if it's not a complete surprise visit, will know about this visit ahead of time. So they can work with you to uh, try to uh, reduce any, any non-compliance that you might have. They also are a good person as a, uh, a go-between between, between you and say, uh, let's, again, let's just say hypothetically uh, someone from the, um, the state EPA uh, shows up and wants to uh, look at your lab. Uh, so if you have your EHS person there with you, they can be a go-between. They can talk about, you know, what are the university's policies at uh, mitigating or correcting any any criticisms or problems that uh, that agency might have pointed out in your lab. So they're a very good person to have on your side, and they're helping you out as you're getting things done. Again, to make sure that everything is compliant, to make sure that everyone is working safely, uh, and that there are no sudden surprises for you. Uh, I'd also suggest trying to figure out where the upper administration is. So uh, find out where the dean's office is and go see the dean. So also knowing the dean's secretary can be just as important as knowing your own secretary because they will know how to run some of the administrative uh, components that we'll talk about later. Uh, and then ultimately remember that the dean and also the provost uh, will be the ones who ultimately decide your fate at the university. While your department and uh, members of other departments will recommend you for uh, tenure, the dean and the provost will be the one who actually signs off on your uh, long-term tenure contract. So it's good to uh, make yourself known and just to be friendly. And uh, it's also possible, um, I'll talk about this a little bit later on, that um, they might know uh, some ways for you to get involved uh, with the university that will be uh, positive uh, university service that you can be involved in in your first couple of years. So those are the people that I would suggest trying to get to know right as you get on campus. So as you are getting started in the lab, uh, those are the uh, groups of people or the people that you want to think about um, uh, that can help you along the way. So what are the tasks that you need to actually get done as a PI? What do you actually need to begin with? Uh, the first is actually taking stock of your area. So again, I have down in that left-hand corner, uh, my suggestion is that you're doing your due diligence. So you're taking stock of your area and you're being careful and precise about. So first you wanna take stock of your lab space. So on the right is a picture of my lab space. It actually is uh, much cleaned out relative to uh, how it was when I, when I first got there. So we have our lab space fairly clean. Um, so take a look at your lab space and look at if anything needs to be cleaned or renovated. If you have old equipment that needs to be removed, you may need to contact your facilities about that. Uh, so for instance, I'll just I'll just share. Um, we had uh, an old shaker that uh, didn't didn't work very well, so it was too big for me to move myself, and uh, I didn't want to put it on my students to to have to lift it up. So we needed to end up contacting facilities, or actually one of my, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. David Sabatino, was uh, kind enough to help me um, with contacting them and getting that done. Uh, 
any alterations that need to, need to be made uh, should be uh, you should make that uh, known to your department and to the dean. So it varies from uh, university to university and from institution to institution, but uh, there may be things that uh, need to be changed or corrected about your uh, lab space that uh, are alterations to the building itself. So for instance, say installing a sink or <coughs> potentially uh, reorganizing outlets or getting uh, larger uh, amperage put into your lab. So that's one thing that uh, I would say a lot of people don't consider. You think, okay, there are outlets on the wall. I'll just plug in as many devices as I need. Uh, we'll talk about later about a way to think about that. But I would suggest if you have these things that are concerns or needs, um, they should be mentioned. So you should take stock of that. Uh, you should look at the floor plan. What does your lab look like relative to the rest of the labs uh, on your floor? So many research institutions are opting for these uh, open lab plans. So you're not just a PI um, working in a, a, a small room sectioned off from the rest of the university. Oftentimes now what you see are these open lab plans where uh, one person's lab area flows directly into the next person's area, which is directly into the um, into further lab areas. So uh, take a look at who's around you and at the size of your uh, the size of their lab, so you can get an idea for how many other researchers there are, how many postdocs and graduate students and undergraduate students are working around. So you can just get a, a general idea of um, sort of the flow through that area. So how many people are there? Uh, where could you potentially put? Uh, say a large piece of equipment, you know, maybe you don't want to put it directly in the hallway that goes that that everybody traffics through. So something to just think about. Uh, one other thing that I would suggest that you really should take account of is um, look at the working environment that is around you in your uh, floor plan in your in the labs right next to you. Uh, make sure that you take note of any problems that need addressing. So this is, these are just an examples from our lab safety. This isn't uh, necessarily uh, anyone in our facility. I think we, we got the top picture off of Google or something like that. But um, what you want to do is take note of sort of the organization of the other labs. If you notice that there are uh, issues in your colleagues' labs, so something that may be unsafe, or something that you feel is a, uh, a negative working environment for the students and um, the researchers in that area, uh, you should make note of that and make that known. You should make it um, make people aware of what the proper safety protocols are, um, and you can, again, rely on your uh, EHS person to help you out with that. So uh, just getting an idea of what sort of is the, the working environment would be good. Uh, so this is actually what I alluded to uh, two slides ago. Uh, you might want to develop the blueprints of your lab. So you can work with the facilities or potentially with the, uh, if your university or institution employs an architect, a uh, person that has the, uh, the blueprints. So consider getting those printed out and, uh, and holding on to those. And, and why would you want to do that? Well, it's for the point that I mentioned earlier, where you can try to plug in as many things as you want but you don't necessarily know what the power capacity is in your room. And I've actually had to take that into consideration. The blueprints should give you an idea of uh, both where the water is going in your lab and where the power is going in your lab. So those are the uh, probably two key things that you will need to conduct your research in whatever kind of research that you're doing, uh, water and power. So you might wanna think about getting those blueprints or asking for a copy of those blueprints so that you can use them in the future to map out you know, where equipment is actually going to go in your lab uh, and if any alterations need to be made. Uh, and then uh, one other concern, again, I mentioned before, is looking at biosafety or hazardous conditions. Do you need to be doing work in, say, uh, biosafety level two or level three facility? Do you need to figure out you know, how to be compliant with that? Um, do you need to make sure that there's proper safety equipment in place? Are there sinks and eye washes and showers? Or is there a way to decontaminate uh, spills? Uh, and is there the proper um, safety uh, contact information up there? So again, these are all things that you need to consider because you are the uh, 
contact person in the lab, you're the PI who is responsible for that. So you need to make sure that everyone is safe and um, you've minimized the, the risks that exist. Uh, I'd also say as part of your taking stock, uh, develop a list of what you have currently, all of the materials and also the uh, equipment that you have, and then a list of what you need. Uh, try to work with the stock room to figure out a timeline for getting those materials. So that will help you figure out uh, when you can get work started. And then also uh, compare this to uh, what you negotiated for your startup loan and look for any gaps that exist. Uh, do you need to uh, renegotiate your, your funding situation? Do you need to uh, consider possibly shifting some of your funds around from, from one year to another? Uh, to get work started a little bit sooner. So if you have a list of what you have and what you need, it's easier for you to work with the uh, with your department and with your upper administration to address those needs. So being organized and doing your due diligence will help you out in this situation. Uh, which leads, I think, um, directly into the concept of developing your financials as you're beginning in your lab. So. I would suggest that you know an, a key point here in the left-hand corner would be keeping track of uh, your financials. So that will benefit you greatly uh, as you begin working in your lab. So I would suggest developing a budget sheet. So I don't know how well you can see my budget sheet there, but um, I have a list of you know the uh, expenses that I've made so far, you know some of the, the sources of funding, um, and what I anticipate spending in the uh, next you know, year or the year after that. Um, it's similar to your list of materials, but uh, it has also costs related to it. So you can use this to uh, compare to your your needs, your list of what you need, and uh, it can help you, you know, to, to negotiate things with other uh, interested parties at your institution or your university. You also might be asked by your department to uh, give a list, uh, an accounting of what you have spent. Um, or as I, as I mentioned to other people before, you may be asked uh, once you have funding by your funding agencies to give an accounting of what you spent. So it's good, I think, to get in the habit of keeping track of this from the very beginning. And uh, it also helps you to uh, slow overspending. So you can realize how much you've spent so far and uh, get a sense of if you need to slow down or if something needs to be um, be changed. Along with that, in uh, developing your financials and keeping track of things, uh, you might consider using online managing software, something like Quirtzy, for instance. So uh, some software like that, so this is for anybody who's not familiar with Quirtzy, this is just a picture of the interface. So this is our interface 3B lab. So it gives us a list of uh, the different things we spent. It also allows us to develop an in inventory, so it's kind of a combination between that uh, list of haves and needs and also your budget. Uh, some of the other things that it can do is it can show you where you might be able to get bulk orders, so uh, bulk orders or alternative suppliers that might reduce the cost of certain things. One small criticism I would have, uh, and this is not to bash Quirtzy in general, I mean this is something you may see uh, elsewhere, is you want to be wary of something called processing or handling fees. So sometimes uh, a certain item may appear on a secondary supplier like this as uh, much cheaper, but there's actually some uh, processing fees involved. Uh, I would liken this to sometimes if anyone is familiar with using eBay. So sometimes you'll see sellers on eBay will post something for uh, a price that is, say, 50% off of what the list price is, uh, but then that 50% is made up in the shipping costs. So I wouldn't say that this is necessarily um, wrong or that this is uh, always going to be the case. You can save a lot of money with these kinds of programs, but just to be aware of the fact that those are, are practices that sometimes come into play. Uh, so, so be aware of that. Um, think, uh, be uh, diligent in uh, keeping track of what's going on with that. Oh, so again, this is a picture of our Quartzy, so you can also um, uh, 
keep track of your own lab. Of, uh, so if you want, you can allow your graduate students or your, your postdocs or other students to put in requests and you can uh, accept those requests and approve them and generate uh, purchase order forms and things like that. So it can also really help you uh, organize your purchasing system. Uh, this, this is actually one thing that I mentioned briefly. So I'll, I, I sort of talked about this already, but um, keeping track of your financials if you get audited. So uh, if you have um, your department will need to know how much money people are spending each semester. Uh, they'll want to be able to report that to the university because they want, will want to know uh, if you're spending the money that they gave you appropriately. So they want to make sure that if you said, you know, you're going to be using X amount of money each year, that that money is actually spent each year. Or, again, if you need to renegotiate and move those funds around. And then also, if you have a grant from an institution like the NIH or the NSF or et cetera, you might need to uh, develop a budget that can go to them where they can review that. Along those lines, I would suggest making sure you keep all of your receipts. As the PI, again, you are responsible for signing off on purchases. So you want to make sure that you sign the invoices and that your uh, receiving and your financial department uh, accounting department has the copy of your signed invoices. Um, they may ask you for them at some later point for a, any number of reasons that they might uh, might require them. So it's just good to keep them on file. I keep everything in a, in a folder for each year uh, so that I can reference them again, so I can bring up the uh, invoices if needed. Uh, but that's key, making sure you keep all of your receipts. Uh, so then we get to, uh, so I'll try to speed it up a little bit here because I know we want to have time for discussion. So one of the key things I think people were interested in is figuring out how to get students in your lab. Uh, so the point that I would uh, really want to hammer home on this particular presentation is thinking about uh, your role as an advisor. So the purpose of doing research uh, as an academic is uh, both to develop new ideas and also to train students who will develop new ideas as well. Uh, advising will probably be a part of your teaching load, so you want to develop a fair systematic approach for advising students. And uh, the thing that I lean on is this concept of an individual development plan, so something that was developed by the American Chemical or that has been promoted by the American Chemical Society, the idea of having a plan in place for each student as far as what they want to accomplish in their graduate career. So this is my uh, IDP, so I call it a Student Personal Strategic Plan, or an SP2, is just a little uh, chemistry joke there. So it has these components. So thinking about what are their actual goals in joining the lab? Do they want to get a job in industry? Uh, do they want to, uh, are they uh, pre-medical students? Do they want to go into medicine? Are they interested in working in public policy? Are they were interested in going into academia? Uh, then developing, uh, describing what skills they have and identifying what skills they would need to get to that goal. Uh, and thinking about, along that lines of their plan, what they could get done in their first year, uh, what they could get done in their, in their future years, uh, and then thinking about a, a mentoring or shadowing opportunity that would help support that process. So I like to tell my students that this is kind of like a contract. It's not a contract where I tell you, you, know, you need to come in uh, 40 or 50 hours a week or whatever it is, uh, but it's a contract where you understand uh, what you want to do and what uh, my expectations are uh, for you, uh, and then I understand what you want to get out of working in the lab so, uh, so that our incentives are aligned uh, such that you can have a productive career as a researcher in this lab. Uh, so how do you meet students? How do you actually, uh, before you, once you've developed your way to uh, approach uh, advising, uh, you can find your students uh, at you know, department seminars or department uh, uh, events. So your, your department will likely invite you to give uh, one of the department seminars early on in your career. It's essentially your job talk uh, given again. So it's your job talk for a larger audience. Um, you have the presentation ready already, I presume. So you can uh, use that to not only um, uh, not only for its initial purpose to convince the university to hire you, but also to convince students to join your lab. Uh, again, I would I would suggest attending some of the departmental social events, 
uh, for both graduate and undergraduate students. So that's where you can get to, to meet some of the students to get a sense for who's actually in the department. I would also suggest uh, one of the things that I try to do is to reach out to the first year student uh, using social media. So um, more formal things like on ResearchGate or on LinkedIn, uh, you might be able to find some of the uh, students if they develop a professional profile uh, may be there. So you might be able to uh, uh, engage with them initially uh, and just, again, being friendly, just introducing yourself, uh, welcoming them to the department and trying to, um, you know, uh, develop this initial point of contact with students. Along those lines, I would suggest creating a website. Get a website uh, as soon as you can. So that really helps bring students in. So they know what your lab does uh, and who is in it. So this is the front page of my lab website. So this is the 3blab.com. So I developed this website so that, again, uh, students and then also people who are interested in potentially uh, funding our lab would know what we do and can kind of see it in a very nice, uh, clean layout. Um, the thing that you want to consider is how do you evaluate the students that you're going to be bringing into your lab? So as a PI, you need to find um, the right students to get into your lab. So your IDP will help you out with that. Um, you can, uh, ha you should probably have a two minute sort of like elevator pitch on your work. Uh, to give to your students, because if you uh, have a prospective student who's interested in working in your lab, and then you give them, you know, an hour-long spiel about what your work is, you may end up with uh, a person, you know, again, remember, a first-year student or someone fresh off of their postdoc potentially switching fields, their eyes might sort of glaze over on it. So you want to be uh, concise, and you want to give them really the highlights of what your research, why you're doing it, uh, and what kind of impact it would make. So, uh, ask questions in the interview about why they want to do research. And I would suggest that you emphasize that you want them to grow to be independent. Uh, you really want to look for someone who has the capability or who has the potential to become an independent researcher so that you don't have to constantly um, be in the lab and direct them exactly what to do. And, and to be honest, that's you know the point of, of being a graduate student or being a postdoc or even being a senior undergraduate student, is to develop those kind of skills to work independently. So what I do is I set up a first meeting with everyone, and I just give them the individual development plan and give them my two-minute elevator pitch and an understanding of the lab. If students are motivated, if they're interested, they'll come back to you with it filled out, and you can then have a discussion about what their goals are and how to help them achieve those goals. Uh, and it's also a good point of reference later on because then you can say, uh, if you need to give somebody a recommendation, you can create a narrative about their uh, time in the lab. You can say, this person started out in the lab, this was their goal, these are the things that they did to proceed to that goal to achieve it, uh, and based on that, I can give this analysis of their work. So it gives a, a good potential for having a, a recommendation. Uh, one thing that our institution doesn't do, but I know a lot of other institutions do, are rotations. So some schools do rotations. Uh, remember that if you're in an institution where you're doing that, um, you need to negotiate with, you potentially need to negotiate with other people in your department as far as the time for uh, your students. So um, rotations can be a good way to uh, allow, um, uh, to, to get uh, current graduate students uh, some training. Um, and you'll probably need to spend some time training the first group and getting them in the lab so that they can then uh, help the future students in the lab. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to talk about, so I'll cover this maybe in the last, like, I'll just go through this like two minutes or so, so we don't get too much. Um, so don't get overwhelmed with administrative work. So that's my last point for the uh, PowerPoint there, the, uh, the uh, left-hand corner. So you'll have a lot of meetings. I would say um, keep a calendar to budget your time. Uh, set aside a certain time of the day where you're going to do meetings uh, and try to book um, lab meetings, so where you can meet with all of your students rather than individual students. Uh, and try to respond to emails in a timely way. That's what will keep people happy, is if you can respond to people um, at, you know, in, a, in a timely manner, you'll develop a good reputation uh, amongst your colleagues. Uh, you'll have, uh, a lot of people have teaching loads, so you might teach a 1-1 or 1-2 or 2-2, so the number of courses you'll teach. Um, set a fixed office hour, and again, try to respond to the emails quickly. That'll keep your, your students happy. Another thing that will help um, keep your students happy is 
post grades as quickly as possible and get a good textbook. And some things that you can use uh, if you are teaching a course, some uh, some will provide online materials where you can actually get some slides that you can alter for your own, uh, but they'll have things like uh, easy, easy ways to build lesson plans and learning goals for that particular chapter. So if you have a good textbook, um, it really helps you to uh, get the most out of your class without having to uh, completely design it from scratch. Uh, your teaching assistants will, will help you out a lot in your classes. Uh, work with your department secretary to find out who the good TAs are. Uh, organize a TA in meeting in the beginning of the year to make sure everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing in the class uh, and check with the TAs uh, on the, the progress of the class. So experienced TAs can really help you out. So if you're teaching a lab, if you can find somebody who taught that, who was a TA for that lab in the previous year, they can really give you advice on how to run it, how to get the resources or the supplies for the lab, how to schedule things. So that can really help save some time. Uh, and then you're going to eventually have to uh, do some, uh, be involved with university service. Try to make sure that your the service that you do uh, corresponds to your startup goals. So things you want to look for are graduate curriculum committees, um, the lab safety committee, and building committees. So these are things that will impact your work uh, through graduate students, through safety, through changes to the building, um, things you might want to do. Take any opportunity that you can to try to get involved uh, with committees that work with or report to higher administration. Because again, that's a way to um, really have extremely impactful service. So things that are impacting the university as a whole will um, make you a key part of that university. So your goal in your uh, academic position should be uh, to improve the university, to do research, and to improve the status of your university. So if you can do that, you'll become very well known uh, and, and a key part of the university, and that will help you towards your uh, tenure case. And uh, the final thought on that is obviously be friendly. So make sure that you're a friendly member of a committee um, and, uh, and try to uh, be productive. And uh, finally, what I want us to consider is thinking about um, making sure that you're getting compensated for your time. So your own benefits. So uh, if you uh, give a lecture outside of the university, make sure that your university takes note of that. Um, talk to uh, some of the invited guests at the university to help build your network uh, and work with your HR department to make sure you're covered on anything. So uh, with that, I just wanted to end the presentation and turn it over for some talk. So this is a, a picture of our lab group, the 3B Lab, uh, and here's some of my information. So.